verse number 23. From Adi ibn Hatim, radiallahu anhu, سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اتقوا النار ولو بشق تمرة Protect yourself from the fire even with half a day. Every little bit counts. Every little effort counts. Making a bit of effort makes a difference. No. It makes a difference for you. Don't make light of what you're able to do or put forward. Don't make light of that. Don't make light of what someone else is able to put forward. But more importantly, don't stop. Put something forward. Don't stop. Put something forward because it can make a difference. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma minkum min ahadin illa sayukallimuhu rabbuhu laysa baynahu wa bayna laysa baynahu wa baynahu tarjuman. There will not be one of you except that he will be spoken to directly by his Lord and there will be no intermediary between them. No one will be carrying the message back and forth. Allah will speak directly. Just thinking of that alone is enough to set you straight. He said, فَيَنْظُرْ أَيْمَنَ مِنْهُ فَلَا يَرَى إِلَّا مَا قَدَّمْ And he will look to his right and he'll only see what he put forward. And he'll look to his left and he'll only see what he put forward. And he'll look in front of him and he will only see the fire to Qa'awaji in front of his face. فَاتَّقُوا nara, And then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam explains what he meant by put forward. Protect yourself from the fire even with half a day. فَمَنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ فَبِكَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ And whoever doesn't even find that with just a good word. SubhanAllah. With just a good word. So on the Day of Judgment, you only have with you the good deeds that you brought. So put some good deeds in. And that's what we should be about. That's what the believer is here for, to fill the world with good things. We've talked before about taking the time to put some ihsan in your good deed to ask, is this effective? Is this actually what people need? Is this actually going to help someone or is this just make me feel better about myself? That's where Ihsan begins. But by all means, don't be a waste of space. Put something forward. And if you don't have anything tangible or physical to put forward, then at least a good word. SubhanAllah, at least a good word. Sometimes we're not able to do something significant to help, but at least we can be easy to get along with. Inshallah. The next hadith, number 24, from Anas radiallahu anhu, qaal, qaal Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna allaha layarda anil abdi an yakul al-aklata fayahmadahu alayha. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is content with his slave that he eats a meal and he praises Allah for it. The so many ways of doing good in the world, even praising Allah for the food that we eat. Oh, yesh raba sharbata fayahmadahu alay. Or he drinks, takes a sip of something and he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. And that brings about the contentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's good. Right? Your whole program is about being good. You try to say something decent to people. You try to bring about some better state of affairs. Even when you eat and drink and appreciate what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you to eat and drink. You praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. It's a mindset. You condition yourself. The believer conditions himself to be in a mindset that is all about what is positive and good. Next, from Abu Musa 
the Prophet ﷺ says, "Ala kulli Muslim in sadaqa." Right, sadaqa is due, charity is due from every believer. And he said to him, "Araita in lam yajid." So he says to the Prophet, "If you don't, what if you don't find it? Find something that you can give." He said, "Ya'malu biyadayhi fayanfa'u nafsahu wa yatasaddaq." Then let him do something with his hands. And he benefits himself, and he also gives in charity. Subhanallah. We have trades here in our country. For example, being a master carpenter, being a master electrician, working with your hands, even a master plumber. Right? People who are actually involved in those aspects of building homes and building buildings. These people right, can make fine money especially if they put in the years of apprenticeship under a master and they get their license, right? SubhanAllah, these are respected fields and they pull in fine money. Any economy that we have should be set up such that a person who uh, masters a trade and works at that trade, especially, particularly at the level of someone who's working with their hands, then, bata kedden, or kadden, Whoever goes to sleep at night, tired out from the work of their own hands, goes to bed forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should have an economy that takes as its criterion that anyone who works at one of these uh, trades should be able to sustain themselves and should be able to sustain their family and achieve health care and all of those basics that make life possible to live. And we need to respect these fields. These fields are very, very important. Because we all need these people. SubhanAllah. What a beautiful thing. During the Ottoman Empire, people like to talk junk about the Ottomans. Every Sultan had to know a trade craft. Sultan Abdul Hamid uh, was a carpenter. And if you go to um, the, the palace that he actually lived in, right? He has like whole, like the, the entire, like all of the chairs in the dining room were like made by him by hand. SubhanAllah. And at one point he was deposed and he had to live under house arrest in this other smaller domicile on the river. And for the entire period that he was under house arrest, he just made himself a carpenter, right? And worked with wood, right? Until. People change their minds or something like that. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful thing. And that's living life. That's living life. So he benefits himself, and from that he can give charity to others. He said, what if he's not able to do that, they asked. And he said, يُعِينُ ذَا الْحَاجَةِ الْمَلْهُوفِ He at least helped someone who is surrounded by his need, right? Someone in a bad situation, right? Someone who's drowning, someone who's surrounded by his situation. But of course, we can't really help people who are drowning if we ourselves don't know how to swim. So we go back to learn a trade. Qala ara'ayta in lam yastatiya. What if he's not able to do that? He said, ya'muru bil ma'roof aw al khayr. Then let him encourage others to do well or to do good. And he said, what if he doesn't do that? And he said, Then let him at least withhold harm because that's a charity. Some people will say that they have a rule, do no harm. Maybe you can't do good, but at least you can refrain from doing harm. That's not a very ambitious policy. But if more people took, undertook that policy, we'd be in a much better state of affairs than we are right now. And here's Rasulullah. So at the very least, let him withhold from doing harm. Withhold from doing evil. SubhanAllah. And in that is a sadaqa. SubhanAllah. So we've reached the end of chapter 13. In Charity puts out the fire of the anger of the Lord. 
There's a hadith from the Prophet والسلام, on that affair. SubhanAllah. Sometimes we find ourselves concerned that we may have done something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be happy with us about. Well, you have sadaqah. Right? SubhanAllah. That's how Islam works. Right? That's why we really functionally do not have slaves anymore. Because there's a lot of things that if you do, if you do it wrong, the only way out is to free a slave if you got him. Right? So what does Islam say? Free him if you got him, boys. Right? And then you end up with no slaves. No, subhanAllah. If we find ourselves in a bad situation, then let's at least tip the scales in our direction by doing just as much good. No? And let's refrain from hurting others. That's the lowest level. The lowest, lowest level that he has. Just refrain from hurting others. But we're done with chapter 13. We're beginning chapter 14. Babu al-Iqtisad fitta'ah. Economy in obedience. Literally. Being moderate in acts of obedience. قال الله تعالى طاها ما أنزلنا عليك القرآن لتشقى. In Surah Taha, he says, We have not revealed this Quran to you that it be a burden for you, that it be a difficulty for you, that the assignments in it, that the wajibat in it, huh, make it very difficult for you. You read Allah bikum al yusra, wa la you read bikum al usra. Allah wants for you ease, and He does not want hardship for you. He does not want hardship for you. Difficulty. No. SubhanAllah. Sometimes things might be inconvenient. Sometimes things might be a challenge. But the obligations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, right, and that we're in a position to fulfill them, they're not impossible. They're not a true difficulty. But they might be inconvenient. They might be a challenge. And people struggle with their challenges. And it's true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease. We can say all types of things about the concepts of these verses. But maybe one thing that would be useful to say is that the deen of Islam that we bring to our lives and we introduce into the lives of others or into the lives of our family has to be an Islam that works in the world that we live in. It can't be an Islam that you have to go to another country in order to practice. It can't be an Islam that you have to create a very special arena in which we can believe in it and practice it. It has to be a deen that can work in the lives of regular people. We should think about that when we think about how the deen operates in this world. SubhanAllah. It can't be a deen that requires you to hide away from the world in order to be able to practice it. And so with those ears, we have to listen to the teachings of the Prophet It's with that understanding that we have to hear the wisdom of the early students of the Sahaba and how they saw the world and to the Warathatul Anbiya, the inheritors of the Prophet والسلام, who bring us this deen because the deen that they had was a deen for the world that they lived in at their time and it would be a deen that would be functional and possible in each world that came about with each successive generation, all the way down to ours. But we don't listen anymore. And we can start listening. Allah will facilitate that for us. The first hadith of this chapter is from Aisha radiallahu anha. <coughs> she says that the Prophet والسلام, came to her and there was a woman there. And he said, who's this? And she said, it's Fulana, it's so-and-so. She's talking about uh, 
she's, she's talking about her prayer, maybe how much she prays. And she's talking to Aisha about, she, you know, she prays all night, she prays all day, you know, mashallah, her situation in prayer is this, and she does this, and she does all these extra that. And he said, ma, meaning he disapproves. Alaykum bima tutikum. You're responsible for what you're able to do. Not to outdo yourself, right? You're not trying to have like a weightlifting session, right? And like, you know, bring it all to the max, you know, and, and uh, wear yourself out, leave it all out on the field, you know, throw up a lung trying to get all those prayers in. No. SubhanAllah. فَوَاللَّهِ لَا يَمَلُّ He says, لَا يَمَلُّ اللَّهُ حَتَّى تَمَلُّ Allah doesn't get bored until you get bored. وَكَانَ أَحَبُّ الدِّينِ إِلَيْهِ مَا دَعَوَ مَصَاحِبُهُ عَلَيْهِ And the most loved way of deen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that a person is consistent with. So, staying up all night, not sleeping at all, and praying and doing all types of ibadah, until one is worn out, and if they had a real job, they would not really be able to function if they went to that real job in the morning. That's not an objective of Islam. But taking on something that you can be consistent with. right? And maybe there are people in some modes of life, or in some spiritual space, uh, in a phase in their life where they're doing magnificently copious amounts of ibadat. Perhaps they spent some period of their youth in the mountains of some country. Or there was a phase of their life where they were over here doing this, or they happened to be in a place in their life, or maybe they don't have a job, or maybe they're a student, and all of these things, and they're able to do all of these things. But that does not become a standard for all others to feel that they must follow, or for them to even say, I'm not practicing like I did when I lived in such and such a place, at such and such an age. Because you're not that person anymore. And you're where you are now. Leading people to believe that they have to do all of these practices that become very, very difficult for a person to be able to handle if they have a real job and a family to support and responsibilities. That's not fair because it confuses people. And in their mind, they feel that uh, they're not doing a good enough job to get by, you know, in their practice of Islam. It's inspiring when uh, we understand that there are levels of devotion and worship that someone can get to, that motivates us to get to where we need to get to. But we shouldn't be in a situation where we start to become hopeless because we're not performing at the level that was described to us, or demanded of us, or, you know, we see among other people. No. And it's also not the way of Islam to invent new types of ibadat to add on or tack on to the practice of the Prophet right? His practice is sufficient for us, subhanAllah. He says here, Allah doesn't get bored until you get bored. SubhanAllah. Tayyib. This is called, this is a device, a literary device called mushakala. It comes from balagha. Allah doesn't get bored. Of course Allah doesn't get bored. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brings a phrase that bring, that takes the idea near to us, meaning Allah doesn't stop being content or pleased with your worship and rewarding it for you until you yourself reach a point where you're no longer paying attention. You're now struggling, your heart isn't in it. You're just trying to complete the whole exercise and process, but the intention is not there like it once was. You're not deeply concentrating on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That element of desire 
that drives your action of ibadah has now petered off. And it's at that point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no longer in, uh, interested. But this device called mushakila, right, it comes into play when, for example, in the Quran, when Allah says, I believe on the tongue of the Prophet Isa, ala nabiyyina wa alayhi afdal salatu wa tamu taslim, huh? You know what's in myself, but I don't know what's in yourself. That's a classic example of mushakila. So almost like a comparative discourse, but it's not meant literally. It's not meant to literally. Right? So it's a, it's a well known device in Arabic literature. And the next hadith is the well known uh, narration from Anas that. Three people came to the houses of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. They asked about the devotional practice of the Messenger ﷺ. But when they were told what he does when he's at home, the special prayers that he prays, Salat al duha and all of these uh, fasting and so on, and the tahajjud and all of this, they seemed to think that it wasn't all that much that Rasulullah was doing. It was more moderate than they had originally assumed. And they said, and where are we from the Prophet And he's been forgiven for any faults he may have had from before and any faults that may come in the future. And one of them said, I'm going to pray every night and I'm never going to stop. And another said, I'm going to fast every single day and never stop. And another one said, I'm never going to be intimate with women huh? and I will never get married ever. And the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came home and he was told about this and he went to these people and said, you're the ones who said such and such and such and such. He said, Wallahi, inni la akhshakum lillah. I'm the most fearful of you all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm the one who has the most taqwa out of all of you. But I fast, and then I don't fast. I pray, and I lay down and rest. And I marry women. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي So whoever wants something other than my sunnah is not from among me, from me. Right? SubhanAllah. Moderation. SubhanAllah, moderation. People go through different phases in their life. Some people go through a phase where maybe we are falling short in our ibadat. We are not doing the sunan that we know we should probably have integrated into our schedule. And we should then take an example of the Salihin and those pious Muslims who have gone before us and were people who did all types of beautiful ibadat and preoccupied their time with us and maybe that will help us to get back to that moderate center. But there's other phases in our life where we're going hard, right? And we're grinding it out and we're maybe even going a little bit overboard. And maybe that's a place where we need to moderate a little bit and find that center. But ultimately, ultimately, nobody knows where you're at except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So it's about looking for the center. The next hadith is from Ibn Mas'ud, radiallahu anhu, number three in the chapter. An important a well-known hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ says, And he said it three times, and it's narrated by Muslim. Imam Nawawi will say the mutanaqti'oon are al-muta'ammiquna al-mutashadduna fi ghayri mawdi'i tashdeed. The people who go too deep and too hard, too severe, in a place where severity is not called for. SubhanAllah. There was a brother once that we met and he was always using the miswak, like always, miswak, miswak, because it's sunnah, 
right? So always a miswak. And somebody said, huh, uh, you know, you're always using that miswak, you know? He says, the sunnah. He said, yeah, but like every second of the day, like every moment, even when you're at a meeting, even when you're... And, you know, the person was like a little bit intense and said, yeah, so he started like doing it so hard he was making his gums bleed, right? Just to show how committed he was to the sunnah. These types of extreme or severe or intense behaviors, if they don't get moderated by a little bit of tarbiya, one day it comes out that the person gets severe and intense with people, you know, in situations. That's never a healthy thing. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us healthy. And good health is supposed to be balanced, right, within one's internal systems. Right, to be balanced out. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet والسلام, said, Inna dina yusrun, wa dina illa ghalaba. That this deen is easy. And no one gets over intense in the deen except the deen will overwhelm them, overcome them, shut them down. So take it easy. He goes on, he says, فَسَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا So, try to hit the mark. Do your best to hit the mark. Get as close to the mark as you can. سَدِّدُوا وَقَارِبُوا Aim for the mark. Aim for what is expected of you. And get as close to it as you can. Take that model of the Prophet والسلام, that model that is laid out in the text of Fiqh, and get as close to it as you can. Aim for that target, right? And if you don't make it the bullseye, at least you won't be too far off the center, right? Aim for the target and get as close as you can. وَأَبْشِرُوا huh? And, hmm? Abshiru, be encouraged. Wasta'inu bil ghadwati wa rawhati wa shay'in min adulja. Subhanallah. He says, Al ghadwa is sayru al awwal wa nahar wa rawha tayyin. So, take advantage of setting out on your journey when things are easy. Meaning, if you leave early and you have to travel on foot, or you have to travel, right, in the open air, then you go early, the sun's not at its highest. Right? And maybe if you take a break when it's at the highest heat, and then travel again after Asr and before Maghrib, right, then the sun is also not at its highest. There's no reason to put yourself in an over-intent situation if that's not the situation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forced you in, not by choice. Don't seek these things out. No. Take advantage of the early morning and the late evening. Right? Take advantage, like for example, of good health. Take advantage of free time. وَشَيْءٍ مِنَ الدُّرْجَةِ Right? In the middle of the night. Right? When you get up and you stand in prayer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah. Wahada wa tamthilun. Right? This is a metaphor. Hmm? And an allegory, Imam Nawi says. Wamaanahu istainu ala ta'atillahi azza wa jal bil a'mali fi wakti nashatikum. Take uh, support for the obedience for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in actions at the times when you have the most energy. And when your hearts are not preoccupied with other types of preoccupation, when your mind is not over preoccupied with other stress. And in such a way that you can actually find a sweet taste to the worship that you're engaged in, wala tas'amuna, and you don't become uh, bored, 
or worn out or distracted. And you reach your destination. Just like an intelligent traveler will seek out to do most of his traveling early in the morning when the sun is not at its hottest or in the early evening after Asr, right? When the sun is also not at its hottest. And in the darkness of night, and in the hot of the middle of the day, both he and his riding mount will take a break. And so, he will reach his appointed destination without excess fatigue, and Allah knows best. The next one is also from Anas. Radiallahu anhu. He said that the Prophet والسلام, went into the masjid فَإِذَا حَبْلٌ مَمْدُودٌ بَيْنَ السَّارِيَتَيْنِ He said that the Prophet went into the masjid and there was a rope strung between two pillars. And he said, what's this rope doing here? And they said, that is uh, the habal for Zainab. So if she gets tired in standing in prayer, she's standing in prayer for so long, right? She throws her arms over it like this and she can still stay standing in prayer. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Bring, take it down. Li yusalli ahadakum nashatahu fa'idha fatara fa'yarqud. Let each of you pray as long as you have energy to pray. And if that energy starts to wane, let them lay down and take a rest. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. Aisha radiallahu anha says that the Prophet said, إِذَا نَعَسَ أَحَدُكُمْ وَهُوَ يُصَلِّ فَلْيَرْقُدْ حَتَّى يَذْهَبَ عَنْهُ النَّوْمِ If one of you is becoming tired while he's praying, then let him lay down until right, the sleep leaves him. فَإِنَّهُ إِذَا صَلَّ وَهُوَ نَاعِسْ لَا يَجْرِي لَعَلَّهُ يَذْهَبُ يَسْتَغْفِرُ فَيَسُبُّ نَفْسَهُ SubhanAllah. So if one of you, because what might happen is someone gets tired, he won't know, Maybe he thinks he's trying to ask Allah to forgive him, but he's actually cursing his own self because he's lost sight of what he's saying. SubhanAllah. Love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that love, find that you want to stand and speak to Allah. Get up and turn your heart to Allah. Give your heart over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that you want to engage in acts of devotion from this love. Not because it's the thing to do or others expect it of you. Do it for yourself. Right? Do it for yourself in the intimacy of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and grow at the pace that you need to grow at. And yes, quality over quantity. Keep the quantity between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like the quality will only be between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have enough quantity in this world. Right? Rene Gueno, in one of his books he wrote was called The Reign of Quantity. We live in a period where there's so much quantity, but so little quality. And that's the understanding of the best generation is my generation, and then the one that follows, and then the one that follows, and how could that be when we have penicillin and they don't? SubhanAllah. We have a lot of quantity. We have a lot more quantity than they ever had. And they remain such that they have quality that we will never attain. Quality still exists in this world, you just have to wade through all of this quantity in order to find it. But make sure you have that in your relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He'll bring you the quantity, both in the returns that you get from your effort, and even the amount of effort that you're putting forward. 
It's like lifting weights. You start out very slow. You start out uh, light. And as your muscles build, as your abilities and your skills become better, you can take on more, you can take on more, you can take on more. Right? But then when a pretty girl walks by, all of a sudden people are like changing the weights. And, you know? So, uh, and, but nothing has gained, except that you won't be able to do anything tomorrow. Right? Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a pretty girl. He's very understanding. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most beautiful thing in existence. And His beauty is not just in the beauty of His names and His attributes, but in the beauty of the actions that He gives to us, in the beauty of the promises that He makes to us. And SubhanAllah, and His gentleness that He has with us, His understanding, and the fact that He never lets you down, He never lets you be alone, He's always there. You can grow your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the pace that you're able. And, alhamdulillah, on the day of judgment, he's the judge, and he's the jury, and he makes the decisions. Because what if we had to show up to the day of judgment, it was like any other day in court, and it was Beni Adam that was going to judge us. Well, if ultimately it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who judges us, then let's stop worrying so much about what Beni Adam thinks. Because Beni Adam is not fair, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-adam. Azza wa Jalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has insaf and any insaf or fairness that may take place in this world, right, only pours out from the source that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a tajalli of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hadith number seven. An Abi Abdullah Jabir ibn Samura. رضي الله عنهما قال كنت أصلي مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم الصلوات فكانت صلاته قصدا وخطبته قصدا I used to pray with the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام many prayers and his prayer was moderate and his speech was moderate right? his sermons were moderate if you look at the khutab of Rasulina sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, they're very short. And the khatibs always say, yeah, he was able to do that, he was Rasulillah, but we need, you know, twice as many words to get our point across. But we understand the aim and the purpose of Islam. It doesn't have to be that difficult. We should be dedicated, we should be committed. Right? And we should swear our loyalty to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be overbearing. And it can understand the world that people live in. It can understand the circumstances and situations that people are going through. And Islam can absorb all of that. Islam can embrace all of that. Islam can receive all people. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received all people. And we should be more like Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, more tolerant. In closing, there's another narration from the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam in which he said, مَا بَلَغَ الْمُنْبَتْ لَا أَرْضًا قَتَعْ وَلَا رَحْلًا أَبْقَى The Munbat never reaches his destination. He covers no ground and leaves no riding mount alive. Right? SubhanAllah. The Munbet is the person who rides his horse into the ground, who rides his family into the ground, who rides his self into the ground. He never rides his huh, team into the ground, his organization into the ground, and never reaches any destination because he can't be moderate. He covers no territory. He covers no territory and he leaves no riding mounts alive. One of the commentators says that no. Ibn Raslan says that the soul or the self 
is a vehicle, like a riding mount, like a camel or a horse. The soul is a riding mount in the world of meaning, or the self is a riding mount in the world of meaning, just like a horse is a riding mount in the physical world. If you overburden it and you work it too hard, it will break, and you will never reach your destination. And yourself is the same. If you overburden it and you push it too hard beyond its capacity, it will break, and you will never reach your Lord. You will never reach your destination. So take care of yourself. Take care of yourself with permissible things and mubahat and rest, and it will be there to carry you through the performance of the acts that are expected of you, the devotions that are expected of you, and it will be there for you to be strong enough to refrain from the things that you feel that you need to restrain from. And it will get you there. And it will still be intact. And the faith will still be intact. No. Take care of yourself. right? And it will be a vehicle that will get you to the end of this world, inshallah. بارك الله فيكم وأحسن الله إليكم أيدكم الله وأسك الله سبحانه وتعالى to sustain us to sustain our hearts to illumine our minds to take us by the hand and give us a light in the dark وأسك الله سبحانه وتعالى to fill our our homes with warmth in the winter time and the coolness of certainty in the summer time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to motivate us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of thankfulness and gratefulness and praise and dhikr and consciousness and conscientiousness. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get us to our destination in one piece. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.